Hello and welcome to Business Daily on Trust TV. Here we bring you up to speed with happenings in the world of business, from the stock market analysis to all the issues around the economy. I am your host, Yusuf Akogo. Here is Salah period, and we say Berka the Salah to all our Muslim brothers and sisters all around the world. I wish them happy Salah as we come gradually, you know, come to the end of the month of Ramadan, a very special month. And we pray that the blessings and lessons of this month resonate with us all the rest of our lives. And we'll move quickly to take our, our business roundup uh, at this moment. Uh, take a look. Guaranteed Trust Holding Company, PLC, has announced plans to slow down on lending and bond trading in Ghana following a $77 million dollars which is equivalent to $35.6 billion impairment in its West African subsidiary. The banking group said it will instead focus its activities on Nigeria and other high-yielding African markets to boost lending by about 15% in 2023. Group Chief Executive Officer of Guaranteed Trust Holding Company, Shegun Agbaje, discloses at an investor conference call in Lagos where he noted that the decision will help the financial institution increase its 2022 profit before tax of 214.2 billion naira by 31%. Ghana exchanged 87.8 billion CDs of notes that paid an average of 19% with bonds returning as little as 8.35%, resulting in losses of financial institutions. Ghanaian authorities are still negotiating with many overseas creditors. The European Parliament approved the world's first comprehensive rules to regulate the wild west world of cryptocurrencies on Thursday, hoping to protect investors against abuse and manipulation. EU member states have already blocked the legislation covering crypto assets, which include cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum and other tradable tokens whose value is secured using blockchain technology such as NFTs. The rules now approved by a large majority of European lawmakers, hope to whip into shape an industry that has been beset by scandals and failures. Under the regulation known as Markets and Crypto Assets, MICA, crypto asset service providers must protect customers' digital wallets and will be liable if they lose investors' crypto assets. Welcome back. Then we we'll move straight to our discussion segment, which is the rising cost of living in Nigeria. A whole lot of uh, prices of a whole lot of commodities have gone up. A visit to the market in recent times will reveal that to you, to almost everywhere in Nigeria. And we quickly go into our discussion segment. And I have joining me via Zoom from Lagos, the Chief Executive Officer with Finance, Mukhtar, Mukhtar Mohamed. Mukhtar Mohamed, thank you very much for joining us on Business Daily today. My pleasure, Yusuf. Always a pleasure to be on your program. Yeah, thank you so much for always being there for us anytime we call. So move, move, let's go quickly now. It's salary period and the complaints everywhere is the high cost of living in Nigeria. People, if you go to the markets, you see, I mean, very few people in the market patronizing, uh, uh, I mean, uh, sellers. What do you think is responsible for this at this time? Yusuf, ordinarily, um, this is a period that price of um, goods go up during the Ramadan, especially when you are going to Sala, especially those items like um, ram and other things, and uh, definitely goes up. But I think this time is is higher than everybody has ever seen. For and we all know the reasons is because of the action and um, that we've been battling for a while, and also we had the cash shortage that came in also. Also, that has also contributed. And I, I mean, um, the exchange rate also is there. I say a lot of things are contributing. Secure, insecurity also is there because local rice prices have jumped over by 200% because of insecurity and high cost of production. So, a lot of factors affecting um, production. And also, of course, you expect the, 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 the producer to put that on the consumers. Mm. Uh, 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 absolutely, putting the cost on the consumer. Uh, if you look at it, the, you did mention inflation. Currently, we, uh, uh, our inflation rate uh, from the last figure released by NBS stand at 22.04%. This is uh, the last time we had this number. I probably have the, the age I am right now. But let's look at it. 
how do you think, <laughs> what do you think the effort of the CBN so far has done in, in, in containing this, uh, uh, the menace? Well, they've used all they are <laughs> Unfortunately, um, the way Nigerian economy runs, not just the tools that it used, the tools that CBN is using is um, the monitoring policy to just hike interest rate, hike interest rate. You sometimes need to look at the reality of your environment and make decisions. And when you look at the inflation rate in Nigeria, you know that there's inflation that is driven by costs, there's inflation that is driven by microeconomic activities, and there's also inflation that is driven by demand and supply. These three are inflation in Nigeria. And the CBN uh, does not have control over those, and it has to lie inside of the executive, because when you bring up policies, then it will drive down inflation. Demand and supply is there because of um, a lot of the goods that used to find their way into the Nigeria market comes in from outside the shop, it's not country, the change rate is high. So definitely most general city patronize those products. Then when you look at them production, the cost of energy is high, so definitely production will go up. And then when you look at microeconomic indices, you just need to look at the informal sector that have been stuck of of cash for a long time because of the narrow redesign policy. So definitely that is um coming up to affect um Nigeria, especially in this festivity period. So definitely cost of goods and services went up when you look at these three major factors. CBN in itself have not been able to control one that is under control, which would have been the exchange rate volatility, because they've not been able to um, manage to get a lot of um, supply of the dollar into the Nigerian economy. The sole supplier of the dollar into the Nigerian economy is the NNPC. And if what reports anything to go by, NNPC will be able to remit any of the uh, 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 um, dollars into the federation account because of uh, the gain in high cost of petroleum product, they lose in terms of subsidy payment. So with that, the, C the CBN uh, are in cash trap in trying to defend the currency or make sure the Naira, both the official and the parallel market, turning out. So for me, I think it's the CBN have done what they can, but the main issue then to this begin to drive investment into the country foreign direct investment, portfolio investment, and then begin to attract Nigeria in the diaspora to come in. This will reduce the volatility of the exchange rate. Once you are able to control the volatility of the exchange rate, I can show you that you have brought down the cost of um, living and inflation almost 50%. Talking about controlling, you say the CBN have used all the tools available to them, and still the Naira continue on the free fall against the major currency, the euro, the pounds, and of course the US dollar. So what do you think they can do? Because as it is, the purchasing powers of Nigeria has been eroded. Well, they can do, cannot do much because they are not in control of it. So they cannot go and print any more dollars in the hands of Nigeria. So the only thing they can do is to see how they can attract investors into Nigeria. And like I said, one of those means by attracting investors into Nigeria, you need to begin to look at um, what 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 attractive uh, investment will people want to do in Nigeria. They mean, how can the CBN help? For me, I think the major thing is we need to look at the CBN attracting investors in terms of trade or um, bringing them to the equity market because of the cheap nature of our of our equity. But unfortunately, they also are facing their own challenges. And then why most of them are not coming? When you look at the difference between the parallel market and the official market, it's so wide. Mm. So most of them would prefer they go to the parallel market and the CBN will not allow that. So definitely, I think we need to, until the CBN able to bridge that gap between the foreign parallel and the, and, uh, and the official market, that's when we attract investors, whether foreign investors or portfolio investors. CBN can attract portfolio investors into the economy by in terms of uh, rising uh, uh, rates, which they have done, so that um, it makes treasury be a little bit more exciting for investors to get high. But unfortunately, this have not um, 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 got the, 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 dire, the desired result. So for now, I think they need to look at how other means of attracting uh, foreign direct in, uh, foreign portfolio investment into Nigeria. And foreign direct investment mostly has to do with federal government policy. That is what we attract foreign direct investors into Nigeria. CBN can attract full investors into Nigeria, but make sure those possible investors stay long and become foreign direct investors. Then the government has to do their they need for. Since it appears from what you say that this current uh, uh, CBN 
uh, governor and of course the entire management have actually stretched their limits. They have, stretched be they have, they have been stretched beyond their limit. Do you foresee a changes, I mean, of course, with the incoming administration, probably at the CBN uh, leadership? Yeah, usually when you look at the CBN Act, the CBN governor still has four years to, I mean, five years. So um, he, he was, was just renewed last year, so you still have a four years uh, based on the CBN Act. But when you look at body language or what transpired before the election, uh, you, must, you might feel that there might be a change of God. But that change of God must be done um, legitimately and in consent with the rule of law. Uh, because the only way the CBN governor can be voted out of office is when you have two third National Assembly members vote against it. Or the same governor send his resignation to the president, and the president in turn send that resignation letter to the National Assembly to be accepted. So I think we should get against doing what the previous administration have done. That's why the administration of um, President Goodluck, Billy Janata, when they remove Lamido's to Lamido, and they cut um, over those decisions. So. For me, I think uh, um, we, we, we should fully believe that the CBN will do the right thing. I mean, the incoming administration will do the right thing to regard the CBN. Uh, before the election, the issue of Naira the design was a, a the fraud burner. A lot of different voices regarding the policy. Some say it was ill time. Some even say the policy was not meant for an economic line in Nigeria. Do you think that is partially responsible for what we're actually seeing now? Yes, it has a role play. Um, it's a good policy. Let's, let's not um, keep talking about this policy if it was a bad policy. If you look at the data the CBN told us, they were able to mop a lot of liquidity, maybe even not because of the inflation to 23 or percent. Um, it's not a bad policy, but I think we got it wrong in the area of implementation because of the kind of economy that we run. We run an informal sector, an informal economy that is largely driven by cash. So what I expected the CBN to have at that time was to reduce liquidity, but gradually return in liquidity, and whereby they build infrastructure. Unfortunately, they did not build infrastructure to make um, cash less seamless for Nigerians. So we had a situation by maybe about 20 million Nigerians used to cashless, but now we have over 60 to 70 million at a time. So the, the infrastructure couldn't take it. It's not that the policy itself was a bad policy. And again, the, the amount of liquidity that was taken out of the system was too high. When you have it about 3 trillion, then you reduced it to about 1 point something trillion. So that did not make sense at the end of the day. But definitely, it had to it, the policy is a bad policy or it was ill time. And what basically happened was that the points of implementation, it was not well thought out. And then secondly, it happened in the political year. And so a lot of political that too came to play. And then politicians also took advantage of it. I can tell you that a lot of politicians took advantage of it. And that is why we, we got to this that we were. Because politicians then we didn't support that policy. Because in an election, it's a year of cash movement. And they saw it as against them. And so they went against it either through the people or through various banks that they have stakes. Mm. Okay, now that the policy has, in a way, been sh not suspended, but sh shifted to the end, I mean, to the end of uh, December by the Supreme Court ruling, uh, do you really think that the, the money now, the old note that was initially withdraw from the, withdrew from the system, that is coming back to the system? Because what most of us actually thought was that, okay, probably the new Naira note that the CBN claimed to have printed will actually be released. But what we are seeing is still the same old note that were withdrawn from the system. Do you really think is CBN is in a way, I mean, uh, confusing itself? I don't know about that. I assume I'm surprised because... Uh, uh, that means the CBN is not going to um, complete with the Supreme Court that um, we need to make sure that both currency, uh, I mean, both the old and the new uh, work hand in hand. I think the CBN did not do that. And for me, it's, it's a very worrisome situation uh, for CBN to be doing that. Because all of a sudden, when that judgment, we are now seeing a lot of the old notes than the new notes. I mean, we don't see the new notes around. All we see is the old notes. No, the old, no, old, no. So, you for concern, uh, knowing fully where the CBN is that um, contract was already awarded for the printing of this new note. At that time, because they printed enough of this new note to go around, 
And so uh, we need to begin to ask BN a lot of questions. There seems to be a lot of integrity on the part of CBN when it came to this charity that either is finally um, 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 agreeing with facts that it was more of political decision than an economic decision. And since the election is over, we turn to the status quo. Okay, um, let's talk about the issue of subsidy. The federal government has fixed June, that's about two months from now, to remove uh, subsidy. And of course, the issue of, they are talking about palliative and so many of, of, of that. Do you think that that's removal of subsidy at this time with the kind of economic crunch that Nigerians are facing, is it not going to tri trigger uh, maybe a, a protest all around the country like we have always witnessed? 2012, 2012 is still on our mind. But then there was the move of political protest at which we have with the president of the Uzbekistan is and at that time a removed subsidy would have been better for it by now. I'm telling you, because then people that were uh, protesting in 2012, they are high from price more than any other administration in the history of the country. So definitely it makes it that it was more of a political decision. And the same of them that are coming to power, the same people that were protesting in 2012, are the ones that are saying that, look, when I get to power, so they must go. So it, it, it's subsidy. More, it, it, I mean, I, I, I am not an advocate of subsidy, but I know that in any economy in the world, there's a little bit of subsidy in any... any but to look at subsidy in the terms of what touches everybody, the rich and the poor, we must not look at the subsidy as just uh, what we can do for the poor. Because the present subsidy actually seems to pay for the poor. But it's not working because they are not benefiting from it. So we need to come with strategy that will help both the poor and the rich. Because in this other subsidy, it seems they are benefiting more than the poor. So I think um, subsidy is, is for me. It's the amount that we are paying in subsidy for petroleum products even uh, cause a lot of um, uh, um, lack of trust from everybody because it seems that we have more cars in Nigeria. Because some things they are not seeing more import into the economy or acquired consumption seems to go high. When when power situation has improved, yet acquired consumption seems to be go high. That shows there's something fundamentally wrong with the subsidy regime. I am an advocate for subsidy removal. Palliative does not work because it does not work in Nigeria. Look at palliative, what type of palliative transportation, and all these palliative are geared towards the Nigerian Labour Congress, only civil servants that works in, in the public sector. What of those in the private sector? What market women? What palliative given to them? They need to think about palliative in a type of market driven palliative that come with in. Not without palliative, we palliative that will create jobs, palliative that will put uh, more, more, more money in the hands of Nigeria. Palliative that will make Nigerians to have better living, not palliative that is geared to even suffering the more because one thousand naira to Nigeria every month, mm. even in the rural area, because the cost of living in the rural area now seems to be more expensive than the cost of living in urban area. If you go to what the Nigerian statistics have been releasing thus far, so definitely we need to look at the subsidy regime. We need to subsidize, but we need to look at other economies. How did they subsidize for everybody? You go to Ghana economy, they decide to subsidize. They went into um, uh, Gizu, subsidize. I mean, that's um, Zambia. When the president of Zambia came, he said, we'll remove subsidy for petroleum products or pay subsidy for, for consumption in Gizu. Because that is what our manufacturers, that's what our industry use. So by that, we'll drive the cost production down. That by that, we'll bring the cost goods and services down. And it's going to affect everybody. You look at Ghana, Ghana look at subsidy and say, okay, what do we do in terms of our own subsidy regime? It's all about let us reduce. Uh, uh, Ghana said we'll begin to pay uh, electrical for, for a percentage of the electrical bill for every year. Those are subsidies. Subsidy is tangible, and you can all see the, what it's doing. But the type of subsidy we are paid in Nigeria is subsidy that is sustainable and tangible. So for me, subsidy must go palliative must come. Palliative must be an all-inclusive palliative that we need to see the if. Because going back to the type of palliative we've been before, we still have the same result. Because you're talking about um, palliative in terms of um, giving of transportation vehicle, giving of money, all this, and they have not worked. So I don't think why this is different. It's insane for you to keep doing the same thing all and think you have a different result. Almost, almost done now. Before we go, uh, there is also a talk about reviewing of salary structure. Uh, given that uh, we've been talking about 
the minimum wage for a very long time. We've seen many states not really being able to implement that. Do you think that removal of subsidy and, of course, increasing salaries of civil servants will in any way help? If you move the civil servant by 20%, inflation goes up by 40%. How does that? So, and most states, like you said, most states of the country have not been able to pay. So, will, will they be able to pay now? So when it comes to minimum wage, if you go to the constitution, it's also because the Nigerian Labour Congress, like playing gallery, comes to minimum wage. Every state needs to determine its own minimum wage. It's not about the federal federal government with their own minimum wage. It's, it's different from what other states because everybody doesn't have the same capability in terms of revenue and also their workings. A state like Lagos can have a minimum wage an electoral promises to me to get more but they want that because they have the resources. Other states have been in and they've still they've not been able to increase the minimum wage or a lot of salaries. So definitely I think when it comes to minimum every state should sit down with their own uh, work and look at their own economic and begin to look at how they can rent it. But to say that answer to Nigerian problem when you remove subsidy and you in turn pay them more minimum wage or less it's, it's commensurate to the percentage in terms of inflation. That is where we will say, okay, your money is making more value, what has been led to it. But once it's not commensurate to inflation, inflation is 22% now. So if the government is going to increase minimum wage, increasing minimum wage 2%, anything outside of that does make sense to Nigerian workers. Mukhtar Mohamed, financial analyst, thank you very much for your time on Business Daily today. My pleasure, Yusuf. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Well, uh, that is much we can take today on Business Daily. Don't forget today is public holiday. And of course, it's Salah. And of course, you know, the market is not, uh, you know, open today. So next week, probably, this definitely will bring you the stock market uh, uh, report like we always do on this show. Thank you again. I am Yusuf Akogu. Bye for now.